Hello, everyone. It's really great to have you with us today for this uh, special uh, Techsylvania event. We have a digital roundtable, which we do uh, every once in a while when we have like a fantastic guest like uh, we have today. And actually, due to popular demand, we have Ryan Beagleman, uh, who was also speaking at our virtual uh, edition last September. We, we have him back for um, for a special session just with him. And um, basically, we will start with a 40 to 45 minute um, talk by, by Ryan. After that, we have a networking session of 15 minutes with, where you can meet each other and, and other attendees. And uh, following that, we have uh, this private uh, Ask Me Anything session with Ryan, where a bunch of you applied and you already received the uh, um, application and the invitation to, to join this meeting. So to kick it off, I'd love to introduce Ryan. Uh, he's like an amazing entrepreneur, and I always uh, uh, try to get him to also visit in person, which he will hopefully uh, agree to uh, for next year. But uh, to tell you a little bit about him, he and his partners bootstrap Bisno Media, an email newsletter and conference business, to over $7 million in annual profit using only an initial $50,000 uh, investment. They eventually sold the business for more than $50 million. And uh, in, in the same time, Ryan also co-founded Summit, which has been called Davos for Gen Y by Forbes. Summit gathers uh, leaders and icons such as Jeff Bezos, uh, Richard Branson, Shonda Rhimes, Jessica Alba, Reed Hastings, founder of Netflix, Ted Turner, and Al Gore. It, it's one of the uh, those amazing conferences you really need to go to. And um, in 2012, um, Ryan and his partners acquired the largest ski resort uh, in the United States called Powder Mountain, where they're developing a resort for the summit community. They sold over 160 million uh, of home sites at that project. And uh, in his spare time, I'm not sure when he has that actually, uh, Ryan also invests in early stage startups such as Uber, Warby Parker, and Co Coinbase. Today, Ryan is an executive coach, investor, and he helps entrepreneurs acquire companies and structure capital. We have a fantastic uh, talk prepared by Ryan today. Ryan, welcome, and uh, I'll let you take it over. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thank you. And uh, am I coming through okay? Well, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I would love to encourage everyone to um, send me as many questions. In fact, if each of you could send me at least one question before the end of the session, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I think it'd be really nice to make it more interactive. And um, But I thought I would um, I would talk today about, about creating wealth. And, um, you know, I've spent the, the last 25 years really trying to understand how to feel well, how to have this experience of well-being. And um, and I've taken it um, a really long way. I've spent just thousands of hours uh, studying and obsessing over this idea of well-being. And, um, and I want to talk about the idea of wealth and, and, and define it more broadly than just uh, financial wealth, although, although that's also, I think, can be very beneficial, of course. But I'm speaking more of uh, true well-being, like a sense of equanimity, a sense of of peace within, um, and a, a sense of ease, uh, kind of like an, an effortlessness um, to life. And um, and so I thought I would speak a bit about how what I've learned and and keeping in mind that I would take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt because I I can I get, you know, although I'm much I have far more moments of well-being now than I did even five to 10 years ago, I, I'm still learning a great deal and I, there's still so much that I, I don't understand. And, um, and so, um, you know, take everything I say with, uh, with it being, you know, my own bias. But having said that, you know, what I've found is that there are, um, there's really three choices that we can make in, in trying to obtain well-being. Um, the first is we can, we can alter our, our, our external environment. So, you know, we can, we can collect money, we can get raises, we can um, achieve status, um, we can change our appearance, we can get others around us to act in certain ways that are in keeping with our, our sense of happiness. Um, but 
you know, what I found is that all too often, one, it just takes an enormous amount of energy to get all the people and objects and things around us to act in just the right way that, that they're in alignment with our well-being. They appeal to our sensitivities. Um, and even if we can get those things to, to be just right, we can, you know, move to a place that has a warm climate and, um, and achieve just enough of the things we're looking for. Uh, I think what I'm sure you've all found, like, it's just, it's, it tends to, to be too temporary and, and fleeting. And so, you know, uh, youth turns to old age and, um, things that are exciting often turn to boredom. Um, you know, there's a, there's a French monk, um, who has a famous Ted talk where he, he speaks about even, even eating dessert or, you know, I think he talks about cake, you know, the first bite is amazing. The second one is delicious, but, you know, 20 bites later and it's, and, and you're disgusted even. Um, and so the second option is to, is to change our internal environment. So instead of changing uh, the external, we, we look to the internal and, and there we can, we can shift things like our, our beliefs, our perspectives. Uh, we can take on more of an abundant perspective than a scarce perspective uh, where we have enough and we're resourceful and resourced. Um, we can change the way we, we relate to ourselves and think of ourselves, the way we relate to others. We can change our focus and our attention. Um, and ultimately what we find is, you know, the mind is the portal through which we interpret everything. And so if we can change our mind, we can change our experience. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've had that experience where you're with a friend and the two of you see uh, or experience something, and one of you has a very different understanding of what just occurred than the other. So you can see, you know, even in those examples, the way our interpretation, our perspective, our belief system, our mental models are um, so determinant of how we experience things. And so thank goodness we, we can actually shift this. And uh, to do so is, I, I wanna speak more about today. It's like, it's a skill, it's a practice um that i'm sure many of you are um, engaged in but i've been amazed by how far we can take that practice and uh, and just how much we can shift our internal environment but i also want to posit that there's a third option and that is um to do a bit of both to change both the internal environment as well as to change the external you know, for a while, when I was becoming more um, spiritual and getting more into mindfulness practice and stoicism and Western psychology and things of that nature, I, I kind of had this attitude that I needed to become more, well, like a monk, like I needed to become so disciplined of mind, um, so nurturing of gratitude, uh, so concentrated, so focused uh, on things like breath, that, that I could really transcend uh, needing to change anything external. I could rid myself of my preferences. I could rid myself of wanting things to be other than they are. Um, and what I finally came around to is that through self-compassion, through self-understanding, through self-love, that I, I can't really change. Um, there's certain boundaries that I've not been able to go beyond. And so there are certain things that I still desire, um, certain things I still need to feel safe, um, such as like a certain degree of finan financial security, um, a certain amount of belonging that I want, you know, in, in my relationships to others. And so I, I basically threw, I used to kind of beat myself up on trying to, you know, be even better in my internal practice. And I think I've come to this kind of middle way where, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to, to expand my boundaries and to expand my perspective and to you know reduce my number of preferences, but at the same time, I'm also going to exert some energy into into altering my external world around me and and seeking certain things that I want, despite the fact that I can imagine a world in which I want nothing, um, and I'm just at ease with with that that which is. So, so in this middle way, we can we can attempt to do a bit of both. And so, uh, I thought I would speak about about the practice of that. Um, so, so how do we do this? Well, I think we can approach it a bit like a scientist. Um, we can essentially observe our, the way we feel, our thoughts, our emotions. We can begin to notice and pay attention to 
our energy level, our enthusiasm? Are we feeling um, uh, are we feeling energized or are we feeling de-energized by any given moment, any given interaction? Um, and through that exploration and through that noticing and through that study, um, we can come to notice patterns. And those patterns can begin to tell us more about what is really true, what is really occurring, who we really are, what we really want, what we don't want. Um, and through that and through experimentation, we can begin to um, come to a better understanding of, of that which would bring us well-being. And we can, we can start to maintain well-being a greater percentage of the day, a greater percentage of the week. Um, and so like just to give ground this in like an example, you know, I was recently uh, struggling with sleep. I, I wasn't sleeping as many hours as I wanted. And so, you know, I bought this, um, this whoop bracelet and it basically tells me how many hours a night I'm actually asleep and how many hours I'm in bed. And I've been basically journaling and experimenting with, you know, what time I eat, what time I go to bed. Um, do I drink, you know, alcohol? Do I not drink alcohol? Um, did I take my dog for a walk late in the night, which maybe got me more alert? Uh, did I take melatonin? Did I not? And so I've been experimenting with all these variables. And over time, uh, I've made market improvements in the amount of sleep I'm, I'm having. So, I mean, that's a, a, a simple and kind of non-emotional example. So I thought I would maybe give one that, that speaks more to um, the emotional state. So um, recently I had an experience where I was, I was overhearing um, two friends of mine that, that came over my house and uh, I was inside the house in the kitchen and they were out on the porch. And I, I heard one of them tell the other one that a friend of ours is, is an asshole. And he, the friend who said this, he didn't realize I had just introduced our friend who, who he was talking to, to this person that he's now calling an asshole. And I went out on the, the porch and I started to kind of debate with him, you know, and argue with him like, oh, you know, he's not really an asshole, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I caught myself because I was kind of noticing that I was entering an argument, uh, which never feels good to me. And so I asked my, my friends if they would give me a moment. And so I, I went back into the house and I just closed my eyes and I noticed my sensory system and I kind of scanned my body for what I was feeling. And uh, at first I noticed I was feeling angry and annoyed that my friend would call this other friend of ours an asshole. And then I started noticing a little further because I've, I've discovered that normally when you feel uh, anger, there's normally another emotion that is um, underneath that emotion. And so uh, I started seeking further and I, I asked myself, was I feeling sad about something? Um, and that didn't seem to resonate. So I, I looked further and I asked myself, maybe it was I feeling embarrassed. And that immediately rang true to me. I could almost feel it like, like in my gut, um, like a hollow feeling of like, being embarrassed about something. And I honestly couldn't figure out what that was initially, although I could sense that it was there. And so I started to search more and and I discovered, oh, I'm, I'm embarrassed because I just introduced uh, this person who's being called an asshole to the guy who um, is being told that the other one's an asshole. So my, my friend is basically telling this guy, hey, Ryan's friend is an asshole. And I just introduced this person to the person he's calling an asshole. And so I was feeling embarrassed about him, you know, now this friend of mine thinking that this guy that he has yet to meet that I just introduced him to on text is in fact an asshole. And so I noticed essentially that I was triggered, right? Like I was, I was not really fully present and I was wrapped around this, this feeling of embarrassment and, and anger. And so rather than continue to engage in that argument, and try to be right where, you know, I felt my friend was, you know, wrong. I decided instead I would ask my friend who called, who said that, you know, the other one's an asshole, if he would go for a walk with me. So I went back out to the porch. I asked him if he would take a walk with me. And in our discussion, I, I basically said, hey, I, you know, to be totally honest, I felt embarrassed um, that you called our friend an asshole. Um, and it made me kind of annoyed and angry. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm really sorry for, 
coming out and arguing with you just a moment ago. Um, you know, what was going on there? Like, what, what makes you call him an asshole? And anyway, I discovered that it was because my friend had um, been having a hard time getting a hold of this guy and he was being kind of flaky. And so I sympathized with him and I asked him if he would mind going back and telling the other friend of ours who he just told, um, said, you know, that this guy's an asshole too. Would, would he mind if he went and told him that there's more to the story? You know, he's not, he's not just an asshole. There's, there's, <laughs> there's good qualities to him too. Uh, because I because I really wanted him to think well of this person I just introduced him to, and he agreed, and and it was all resolved. And but I tell the story because I've what I've been finding is all too often I'm not even really aware of my state of my emotional state of my nervous system, and we have these seven trillion nerve endings, and they're constantly feeding us information, and a lot of that data just goes unnoticed, and so part of what i'm practicing is just bringing greater noticing bring, 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 bringing a greater sense of um, observing of observation to my entire physical state my my gut the feelings in my chest my heart uh, sometimes i notice i feel fear kind of in my back and like my shoulder blade um, and as well of course as paying attention to the area um, above our shoulders where we spend much more of our attention typically, you know, focusing on what's happening in my cognitive capacity. And through that noticing, I am um, becoming increasingly sensitive uh, to these patterns that emerge. For instance, the pattern that typically anger comes with either sadness or embarrassment kind of buried underneath. Um, and we, we kind of, I've found, at least in my experience, I grab for anger because it gives me a sense of control, uh, like a sense of agency. And it gives me the ability to uh, avoid these more uh, like tender and awkward feelings of, um, of like sadness or embarrassment. Um, and so in noticing that, I've noticed that I can, I can transcend those emotions through curiosity, uh, through asking myself questions about what it is that's making me feel this way, what what could be you know what is it that might allow me to feel feel better? Um, what would I have to communicate? What you know who would I have to engage with? What would I have to reveal about myself uh, to another? Um, what perspective might I have to shift? Um, and what is it ultimately that I really want? And uh, and, you know, Plato talks about this idea that the more you really understand yourself, the more you become grounded and you essentially become less prone to um, kind of the whiplash of your emotional states where, you know, a, a strong emotion arises and it really ruins your state for, you know, minutes, hours, days. Uh, the more that you really understand yourself and the more that you're really grounded in who you really are, um, and to really understand your, your kind of connection to all that is, to your connection to others, your connection to nature, um, the more stable that you become, uh, the less reactive, uh, the greater perspective. Um, and from that, you, you have incredible agency for, for sounder decision-making, um, for better strategy uh, in, in all things, whether that be business or and just how to you know navigate friendships, and so this this has become a huge part of my internal practice. Uh, so, if you have any questions, though, uh, drop them in the thread because I I could I could stop here too. And let me see if there's anything that's worth uh, anything that's a good question in here. All right, nothing yet. But yeah, send me some questions. I'd, I'd love to uh, to engage with you on, on anything specific that's coming up for you as I'm talking about this. Um, so I'll continue in the meantime. A, um, you know, as part of this, when I when I explain this, I often get asked um, about, okay, great. So, you know, we're trying to change um, our internal state, but, you know, I still really... I'm still seeking a sense of meaning. I'm still trying to figure out what to do, um, you know, perhaps with my goals and my career and, 
making money and accomplishing things and having impact. Um, and so I thought I could speak a minute uh, about that as well. Um, what, I, what I've been finding in, is um, there's this Japanese concept of, uh, of ikigai uh, or ikigai, I'm not sure the right pronunciation, but, um, but it's basically this concept where there's kind of this Venn diagram where you take the things that you're really good at um, the things that um, the, you take something that the market really needs um, and, um, and at the intersection of, of what you're really good at um, and what the market needs um, and um, you, you can start to find opportunities that, uh, that can unlock your full potential. And, um, and so one thing that I've been doing over the past couple of years is really trying to understand uh, more of what I'm really curious about. I, I've been finding curiosity to be almost a more useful heuristic than, um, than like what I'm passionate about. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, I've been trying to figure out like some really practical ways. So one thing I've been doing is every month I've been going through all of my photos and my photo reel on my iPhone and looking at and writing down more of my highlights and more of my lowlights. And I've been doing the same thing with my calendar, where I go through my calendar and I think about moments, meetings, uh, activities that I had, to-dos that I was working on, where I was feeling energized and enthusiastic, where I was feeling expansive, I was growing, um, I was feeling connection, I was feeling belonging, I was feeling uh, creativity, uh, I was feeling love. And I've been basically trying to notice the patterns, kind of like what I was doing with, with trying to figure out how to sleep more around what it is that I really love to do, uh, what it is that I'm really curious about, what really brings me energy, and, and what detracts my energy. And, and through that exercise, reflecting on, you know, what it is that I, that I really want, what, what, are the, what are the skills I really want to develop, um, what are the curiosities I really want to pursue. Um, and what I found is, as part of this exercise, I almost have to rid myself of, of like notions and ideas and the sense that like I, I owe something to others um, in order to be able to kind of clear my space so that I can really um, more fully self-express. So to give like a recent example, I was thinking, you know, over the last couple of years of buying another company or starting another company and I really did not, I was kind of dreading it and I, I couldn't quite figure out why. Um, I love the creativity of building companies, but I just, having spent 13 years running companies um, the last 13 years or so, I just really wasn't feeling drawn to it. And so I couldn't figure out what was happening. What was it that was motivating me to pursue something that I wasn't really feeling drawn to? And part of that was, you know, wanting to make more money. But part of that was this notion that, I needed to build enterprise value. This this idea that, you know, I, I need to build something that makes money in my sleep, and so I started exploring. You know, when was the first time I, I had that feeling or had that idea, and I traced it back to my father. My my dad, who's an entrepreneur, he'd always, he'd always told me, you know, don't rent your time, uh, build assets, uh, take risk, um, and when I started having this feeling, I started I started trying to figure out if I could let go of that. So I literally started doing this, um, this meditation where I would imagine that I am connected to my dad energetically. Um, they're almost like there's like, a, like, like, like an umbilical cord connecting us like, and my energy is trapped, is kind of tied up in his, you know, looking for some sense of his approval, him, you know, thinking highly of me. And in so doing, I'm basically kind of downloaded a lot of his ideas, a lot of his notions, a lot of his affirmations, which were all given to me, you know, for good reason. He was really trying to help me um, provide for a good future for me when he was teaching me about these ideas. But I decided I would, I would, you know, metaphorically imagine releasing them and taking back the energy I have tied up with him to get his approval and releasing these notions back to him. 
And and it wasn't just with him, you know, a lot of my friends are, are entrepreneurs and others that I want to kind of think highly of me. And so I had a bunch of ideas around, you know, that it would kind of be, that there was something kind of odd to me doing something other than building enterprise value. But in the process, um, this, this notion of being an, a, a coach came up and I was really resistant to it, but I ended up deciding that I would kind of like rapid prototype and experiment with it. So I took on a couple of clients and I discovered that I loved it, um, and that so much of what I enjoyed being a, enjoyed as a CEO was really about mentoring people and helping others and advising others um, and solving problems together and, and coming to collaborative decisions. And so I started discovering that man, this is really this is really fulfilling. And uh, but it took kind of like letting go of some notions and really studying what was coming up for me. And so. What, what's become clear to me is that if we have um, if we have the um, the courage it's really a it's really a fearlessness that's required um, to go beyond the notions and the ideas of those who respect us and rely on us those who encouraged us those who invested in us if we can kind of be more of our own imagine almost like you're emanating this aura around you. There's this bubble around you that emanates from the energy from within you. Imagine filling yourself more of who you really are, more of your real self-expression, more of your laughter, of your joyfulness, more of your creativity, um, more of the, the weirdness that is you. All the peculiar um both genetic and uh, you know, kind of nurtured things that made you who you are up until this very moment. F imagine filling this this kind of globe around yourself, this orb, with more of yourself, and then imagine that there's all this kind of scattered energy that you've you've scattered out there among all your friends and loved ones and society and the people who follow you on Twitter and, and Instagram and. And you've kind of scattered your energy out there, uh, perhaps, or at least I know I have, in seeking things, in seeking safety, in seeking belonging, in seeking reputation, money, um, approval. Imagine collecting all of that and bringing it back into the sphere and filling the sphere almost as though it's like here to protect you and to give you space so in which you can more fully self-express. And what is amazing is that, you know, in the, in the interest of, um, in the interest of being seen, you know, in the interest of being approved, in some ways we've made parts of ourselves invisible. And there's this opportunity through courageously learning about yourself and studying and noticing what really makes you tick, that you can begin to unfurl parts of you that have been kind of trapped, um, buried, uh, you know, kind of caked in dust, if you will, and let them kind of shine. And, and you can kind of almost say to the people who gave you their ideas and notions, <laughs> including myself right now, you know, hey, Thanks for those. They, you know, perhaps they even served me, but kind of, you know, no thanks. Um, and I want to look within to see what's really true for me. Um, and in that process comes this kind of greater clarity about, you know, what it really means to be uh, fully expressed and. And um, and to live in that kind of vibration, this like almost like higher, uh, you know, this higher vibe, this higher vibration of, your, of yourself, this kind of joyful, bubbly, effervescent, fun, giggly, uh, imaginative, childlike uh, version of you. And from that place, I am certain that you can have all of the safety that you require. I think it's it's almost um, shockingly easy uh, once you once you go there. And it takes a bit of faith to kind of take the full leap. But what I found is if you take that leap, 
what happens is as you begin to express more of who you are, people start to be drawn into you and you almost naturally start to tell the world what it is that you're looking for or what it is that you want and people start to give it to you. And it, it feels like the universe is just delivering you gifts um, and almost like it's like miraculous, but it is, um, it is truly um, a process of just the world is recognizing what it is you want. So take my example you know, I was really scared to be totally transparent uh, that, that if I didn't start a company, that I wouldn't make um, this pretty significant amount of money that I wanted to make in order to support my family and, and still live in New York City, which is a crazy expensive place to live. And although I had sold, you know, some companies and I had some money, um, I didn't, I still didn't feel like it was enough to take care of all the things I wanted to take care of and get ready for having children and, you know, all the expenses that come with that and, um, and supporting my family and supporting others in my, in my, in my world that, that, you know, rely on me financially. And so I, um, I was kind of fearful about that. And so to my surprise, as I launched into coaching, I had no idea. I thought coaches just don't make that much money. They, they certainly don't make, I, mean, I certainly didn't think they make enough to, to, to earn what I was looking for. And, I'm here to report that that was false. Um, I've I've managed now to build up this amazing um, set of 18 clients, and um, and they 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 pay me. I, I guess I'll just share it. I mean, uh, just as an example, they they pay four thousand dollars a month, and I mean you can do the math: eighteen times four thousand, like it adds up to a bunch of money. And um, but I was really shocked by this, like doing something that I really thought would be really, it's this joyful and this freeing and this fun um, where I can work. I'm in Miami right now and I'm, you know, I go to the beach every day and it just, it just feels uh, miraculous. And I, I, I don't mean to use myself too much as an example because, you know, I, I'm, I'm privileged in many ways and, there's, and it's not to suggest that, um, you know, everything I'm doing can be replicated necessarily. But I, but I do think it's true that um, that if you follow what you really love, people people gravitate and you build. You, you're, and because you're so curious about it, you naturally become an expert at it, and and people pay for expertise. And so, uh, and that might take you know five years or ten years or fifteen, but it's I think it's very very doable. And I think it's more doable than ever with all the amazing technology that's available to us and the marketing and distribution channels that are so readily available. Where we can all be our own media company um, on Twitter and on social and on TikTok and um, and there's no code and all these really, you know, just amazingly um, cheap and accessible ways of building um, anything you want. Uh, and so, um, so that's a bit about, about this concept of Ikigai. And, you know, but once you kind of, use your this this process one thing you can do although i don't think it's necessary but if it helps you have a feeling of like direction what you can do is nail down um a purpose um and so um you can define a purpose so like m my purpose is something like um to um, experience a greater sense of peace within and in so doing help others experience the same and then I have an end goal, and my end goal is something um, slightly more specific. So my end goal is to become masterful at being um, a coach uh, and being someone who can help people uh, develop a sense of peace within, whatever that means for them. And so my end goal supports my purpose. And then I have performance goals. And my performance goals are, you know, what they call like smart, smart goals. So my performance goals are, um, they're specific, they're measurable, they're actionable, they're, they're, they're hard to achieve, but achievable, um, and they're time bound. So, you know, like one of my performance goals uh, for Q1 uh, was like, you know, have at least 15 coaching clients paying XYZ uh, by March 31st, 2021. Um, you know, another goal of mine was, you know, I was practicing getting better at tennis was to to um, beat my dad in tennis. I wanted to take four sets off him in a row. Uh, he's always been a better player than me. 
Um, you know, I wanted to achieve certain things in, in my marriage. Uh, so I set out these very specific performance goals and the performance goals allow me to unlock my end goal and uh, my end goal allows me to unlock my purpose. And then I also set some stretch goals uh, just kind of for fun to challenge myself. And I also developed uh, a list of about 10 habits. And I use this app called uh, Streaks, like S-T-R-E-A-K-S. And I developed a bunch of habits like get seven hours of sleep and um, read about coaching for two hours a day and, um, and a bunch of other things that basically these habits, if I do them daily, or at least, you know, three to four days a week, um, then they will naturally allow me to hit my performance goals. My performance goals will let me hit my end goal. My end goal will allow me to achieve my purpose. And, and you know, and I'm regularly kind of revisiting um, this kind of framework because my understanding of myself shifts, you know, every week and month and year. And so I don't think it should be fixed necessarily. Um, but I've, I've been finding that kind of framework to work. And I, I built all this out like in a spreadsheet, basically, in like a Google Share doc. And, um, and I've been kind of using this uh, doc to kind of track things. And it's almost like my own little like, you know, personal CRM uh, for my, you know, achieving these, this, this sense of purpose. Um, so I'll pause there. Let me just take a look at these questions. Okay, so Irina said, did you find your current findings about what makes you vibrate, engaged to be coherent with what made you uh, happy in the past, or do these aspects just change over time? So you need to go through a constant self-discovery. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've found that all things are changed. Um, my understanding of myself is always changing. And, um, and what I really want is always changing. I, I've found that there are kind of like seasons to, to life, to years. Um, the things that I want, uh, you know, I'm now 38 years old today are not the same things I wanted um, when I was uh, 28 years old or even 36 years old. And, uh, but I'm kind of integrating past learnings and past knowledge. And that integration is, allow is actually allowing me to transcend. I, I kind of have learned to stop almost forcing myself or efforting too hard to kind of accelerate uh, my growth, although I am always really enjoying growth. And so there is still a part of me that kind of chases that. But I found that just new versions of myself and new consciousness kind of arises from within almost naturally through just like unexpected serendipity and, and, and circumstances. You know, I go through challenging obstacles, um, you know, like this, like like we all went through this past year's pandemic and, you know, new understandings emerge. Um, and so constantly reevaluating um, what it is I really want, who I really am, what I'm really kind of what my energy um, is really being drawn towards. And uh, and, I, and what I'm more focused on is just developing this, this skill of noticing and this ability to become like an ever more sensitive, almost like thermometer that lives within that can kind of read the, the temperature of my body language, of my breath, and, uh, and to take in more of the, the data that I'm otherwise missing. Um, let's see. Do you think that being authentic makes it easier to embrace uncertainty? Well, I'll say this about uncertainty. I think the more that you know yourself um, and the more that you understand um, that which is, like the system in which we live in, uh, the way that the universe is working, the way relationships work, um, the more that you can kind of align yourself with all of that is occurring within yourself and externally. And through that, um, uncertainty just becomes much less of a 
um, it becomes less perceived as an obstacle. You kind of feel like everything is here to serve you. Um, you know, there's this idea of pronoia, which is this idea that instead of being paranoid, you're pronoid, right? You you believe that all things are here to serve you, and um, that is a perspective. Uh, that you can shift into through practice. It's a hard perspective to maintain 24-7, um, but it's a practice that you can uh, maintain it more of the time. And I think if you if you really pay attention to how the universe works, you'll start to notice that change is uh, neither bad nor good, that the labeling of change as bad or good is simply a part of our prefrontal cortex it's just part of this like language center in the brain you know call it the ego call it the language center whatever you will that's just constantly labeling things it's a very useful part of the brain it's extremely uh, beneficial i mean without it we'd have a hard time problem solving and discerning things but it's um but it's an almost overactive part of the brain that is kind of like um too much in in the driver's seat too much of the time and so if you can notice when you're labeling something as an obstacle, as negative, um, uh, and instead get curious about what is it that's changing that actually could be beneficial to me, even if I'm experiencing some sort of loss of something that I, I felt I enjoyed or provided me safety, um, and what might be possible through embracing this change. And if we can you know, resist less, and go with the flow more um, and look for the opportunity within that flow, it just, life just gets a lot easier. Um, and, 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 and a joyfulness almost is a, like an emergent property of this practice is just um, mirth, joyfulness, um, levity. You become just creative and imaginative. Uh, I like to use my imagination a lot for things like this. So like, um, like the other day my mom was visiting and she was saying something that was really annoying me. And I was thinking, I, and I made a game out of it. I was like, oh, my mom is pushing my buttons. And I was like, buttons, buttons, buttons. And I started imagining like big giant buttons, like coming down the street, uh, coming after me here in Miami, this button that's like clicking and like chasing me down the street. <laughs> and I, it made me laugh and like lighten the mood and like kind of gave me perspective on the kind of absurdity of life, the kind of cosmic joke that is occurring. Uh, this relationship with me and my mom, who I love and who loves me. And here we are in this moment, me being triggered by my mom and becoming me becoming defensive uh, is kind of absurd and hilarious and um and and so out of that emerged like this fun buttons thing right and i actually told my mom i'm like you know hey you're pushing my buttons and and we, we kind of laughed together um and uh and like new possibilities emerged you know where we could communicate on a different level uh i could you know i could say to my mom like Hey, I sense that you're judging me about something, but what, what do you really tell me? What you really want? Um, and even that took some exploring. Her first answer was was not what she really wanted. It was another. It was another criticism. Um, but the truth is, she was just feeling herself triggered about something, and then I was being triggered in reacting to her. And so, um, that is one thought on uncertainty. Uh, and I'll say one last thing on uncertainty is. Just notice how the things that seemed um, scary, like that were labeled as like misfortunate, somehow there ended up being a piece that was fortunate later. Um, and so anyway, I'm happy to speak more about that um, if you, if, uh, later if you like. Um, the Habits app, oh yeah, someone answered, it's called Streaks, S-T-R-E-A-K-S. Um, so someone said, I agree meditation is the best tool to be grateful and present, but as an entrepreneur, most anxieties are built around success factors around my startup. I am wondering how much of those anxieties exists once you become financially free. I can't imagine any more anxieties after. <laughs> oh man, I, w I only wish that were so. Um, so a word about anxiety. 
you know, your body is this brilliant uh, nervous system. It's, it's really like an electrical system, right? Uh, your spinal cord connects up into your brain and from the spinal cord extends out this incredible neural network throughout your body. And it is just pumping your, your brain full of information throughout the day through your eyesight, through your, your, your listening, your tactile senses, et cetera. And your body is essentially sending you an alarm of sorts when it's feeling anxiety and it is kind of teaching you something. And if you get curious about what that is, and I mean, extremely curious, like the first, you know, six things you figure out are going to be six of 6,000. Like there's a lot to uncover there. Um, and if you chase after that a bit, if you kind of um, peel that apart and question, uh, maybe get someone else to do this with, you know, the Socratic method is a brilliant way of doing this where someone asks you questions about the anxiety. Um, great questions are, are generally to avoid why questions. Uh, why kind of puts people on their heels? Like, why are you this, feeling this way? It's more like, um, what is it that you're feeling? Where are you feeling it? Um, what would have to be true for you to not experience this? Tell me more about that. What is it that you believe? What is it that you don't believe? Um, and as you explore those kinds of things, which you could do with a journal, you could do with a, um, with a friend, you could do with yourself, you could go for a walk. Uh, of course, you can do it with a coach. Um, you can start to unravel um, great insights. One thing is you can use your anxiety and you can channel it like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like you're almost like in judo where you take the motion of the person that you're fighting with and you use that motion against them. You kind of use like them attacking you to, you know, imagine grabbing them and flipping them, right? So like you take this anxiety that's emerging from within and you channel it into motivating you to say, get work done or be creative um, or to get so motivated as to change a perspective that you've held or let go of a notion. Um, maybe you have a notion around needing a certain amount of money. Maybe you could go um, study. How much money do you really need? How much are you really spending? Do you actually need to make uh, this much money or could you make this much money? Um, and through these explorations, you, you might be surprised that you can significantly reduce your anxiety even without obtaining the goals that you thought uh, were relevant. So like, you know, maybe you think, oh, once I make a certain amount of money, my anxiety will, will, will disappear. That very well may be true uh, to some extent, but you can change something internally. Uh, say it's gonna take you five more years to make that amount of money. I assure you, you could have five really good years if you spend the next six months trying to shift some perspectives, shift some beliefs, like what would have to be true for me to experience less anxiety on this path um what if it what if i decided i was happy with this this journey taking you know 20 years instead of five or um what would happen if i uh had the courage to to drop what i'm doing and pick up something i enjoy doing more to make make this amount of money or um maybe it's the way i relate to uh, decision making. Maybe I need to delegate more. Maybe so. I, you know, I'm I'm not going to be able to answer any any specific um, example here for you, uh, but there is an answer to that, and it, and it can be resolved internally. And it's usually not one thing. You, developing a number of tools in your toolbox for this could be really helpful. I think meditation is only one of those. Uh, I think mindfulness practice throughout your day is another one, which is a, a little bit different than meditation. Um, uh, I think psychedelics and psilocybin are extremely useful as tools for um, gaining insights uh, and applying them. It kind of shuts your ego down long enough that you can really see what's kind of going on uh, in the rest of your mind and the rest of your your, your body. Um, I think exercise is, is, an, is an excellent tool. So anyway, I think there's a number of tools you can kind of bring to this, to this query. Um, let's see. Since the pandemic, I've seen people becoming edgier and more likely to snap at each other. Even I find myself more likely to get angry over, over tiny things. Are there simple things we can do to reduce tension around us or to de-escalate a situation? Yeah, I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, um, noticing is really the beginning step. 
developing this, you know, imagine developing, you almost could give it a name, like this like watcher. It kind of sits somewhere back here and it, it literally like almost like it's like a video camera that's always running. It's watching what's occurring within you. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to have a moment where you're going, oh, I, I, I have the watcher and I see that I'm having a feeling of, um, you know, anxiousness or I'm having a feeling of joy and, um, and I'm thinking about my to-do list. And, and then you'll notice that 20 seconds later, you're just immersed in your to-do list and you've lost the watching of you doing the to-do list. You're just now, you kind of zoomed in and you're now just in the, in the mind doing the to-do list. And then what you'll do is you'll catch, if you're working on this as a, as a practice, you'll catch yourself in that moment and you'll go, oh, Earth, Earth to Ryan, Earth to Ryan, hey, hey Ryan, hey, we're still here uh, and we're still making the to-do list. Why don't we check in like, hey, yeah, that's right, now the watcher's back. Like, yes, we are still making the to-do list. I know I was experiencing you know, X, Y, Z a moment ago. Oh, I wonder if I can add um, breath to this moment. You know, oh, and that's, that feels good. Um, hey, could we notice our feet on the ground? Or could we notice our butt sitting in the seat? Can we kind of ground our, ourselves in this very moment? And what's cool about the mind is it can juggle noticing and at the same time doing the doing the to-do list. It's able to balance both these things at the same time. So. I mean, throughout my day, I am noticing and then shifting and noticing and then shifting. And I use many different tricks for the shifting part. Sometimes I shift by noticing my breath. Sometimes I shift by saying Earth to Ryan. Sometimes I shift by kind of just smiling and just noticing the, the awesomeness of the moment or the absurdity of my emotional state or perspective. Um, or I'll look at like, oh, wow, I'm only looking at one option, but there's three options for me right now. I could get angry, you know, about this. Um, you know, my flight was just delayed. I could get angry that the flight was just delayed. I wonder if there's an opportunity here. Oh, I could take this moment to sit and, you know, catch up on watching a fun show on my iPad, or I could call a loved one and catch up because I've got an extra two hours at the airport. And then I have all this this like agency and this this creativity that I can bring to the moment. So this is kind of the the practice that I'm I'm performing. And this practice is a muscle, and the muscle gets more capable and more automatic uh, with time. And um, and you just become more more stable. And by the way, if if others around you are experiencing anxiety, you can kind of just let them experience anxiety. Um, you you have many options, right? I mean, you could seek to help them, but you also could just notice that like, okay, yeah, my friends and family, they they go through anger perhaps, and then the anger dissipates. Like a, a day later, they're not as angry about the thing they were angry about typically. And so I can just kind of let them experience their anger and notice it and maybe leave them the, the space and time for that. Or I could give them a hug or I could um, crack a joke to try to help the situation along a little bit. Um, or I could just go about my business and just let them be and know that they're they're going to be okay and I, I don't have to be a savior and help them with this. Um, so that's a few words on, on that. Um, here's another question. Also regarding – oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Let's take this, uh, this last question maybe, and after that we can head over to the private Ask Me Anything session. Okay. Also, regarding the pandemic, being at home more time than usual makes it very easy to work 10 plus hours a day. Since you were mentioning earlier about accelerating growth, any tricks on knowing when to stop working and attain some balance? So <clears throat> I really believe in your nervous system is incredibly intelligent, as I've been mentioning. There's, I think we only look to here for intelligence, but there's so much intelligence here and in the gut. Um, and in all parts of your body. And you're getting feedback all the time. You're getting feedback from friends and family telling you perhaps, hey, you should work less. Uh, maybe you're getting feedback from yourself. No notice that you're asking this question. That itself is, is something worth noticing. Your, um, you know, notice where your attention is. Like in this case, you, you know, you could have asked me any number of questions. 
it's interesting that this is one of your questions. So it sounds like to me, like your nervous system is sticking up for you and telling you something that it wants you to explore. And if you really get, if you put the kind of energy and creativity you put into your business, um, into solving this question, I, I think you'll come up with many really uh, sound answers. Um, you know, just to, to help you along a little bit, um, you know, I could imagine um, unleashing the the power of your calendar a bit, you know, coming up with some, it, it's hard to have the willpower to work less. So coming up with some uh, frameworks, uh, some some kind of like uh, some some kind of guiding posts that might help ensure that you don't work so, as so many hours. So for instance, if you count the number of hours you work each day, you know, I know that when you count calories, you know, people tend to, to uh, be more careful with their calorie intake. So you could try counting it, you could keep it in a journal. Uh, you could take a practice where like, you know, every time you see something red, you know, you're gonna check in and notice your state. Like, how are you feeling? Um, and you could just pause for a moment. And through no well, as you increase awareness, as you increase noticing, you'll just naturally do more things that feel good. You'll have more motivation to not do the things that don't serve you. So you'll start to notice like, Oh, well, on days where I worked, you know, 10 hours, you know, I didn't get to the gym and I didn't sleep as well. And I'm starting to notice that because I'm paying more attention to sleep or I'm paying more attention to my energy level. And so that'll start to create some more motivation. You might have to ask questions like, you know, well, what would have to be true for me to work less? You know, maybe there's some feeling of safety that you feel you can't achieve unless you work 10 hours a day. Maybe there's a certain amount of money or, and so there might be some other creative way to get that. Maybe you could lower your expenses or, uh, or, you know, find a way to ask, you know, your employer for more pay or so, you know, there, there might be some other creative solution. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll leave it there, but, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. This has been a, re a really great session. I appreciate you sharing all of these insights with us and uh, taking most of the questions in the chat. I suggest that we have a 10 minute break. Um, the attendees can go grab a glass of water, or as I mentioned earlier, the networking sessions are open. You can find the menu in the left left hand side of your screen and you can just go there and meet randomly some of the other attendees for three minutes. And then uh, for the ones of you that applied for the private Ask Me Anything session with Ryan, we will see you there in about 10 minutes. Does that work, Ryan? Okay. Uh, you will see the sessions button on your left-hand side in Hopin. Just go there and you will see the session with Ryan. Click on it and you will be in the feed. So in 10 minutes from now, we will see you all there. Thanks, Ryan, for hosting the session oh, again. Uh, and one, one last thing, if you want to reach me for any reason, uh, I'm ryanbeagleman.com. Uh, it's a B-E-G-E-L-M-A-N. And uh, you can email me there uh, if you need anything or you can follow me on Twitter. Yes, and we will also post this uh, session on our uh, Texylvania YouTube channel and Facebook. We will also send it out to all of the attendees. So thanks again. Awesome. Thanks so much.